The reign of terror is over. The slums will soon be a memory. We will turn our prisons into factories and our jails into storehouses and corn cribs. Men will walk upright now. Women will smile and children will laugh. Hell will forever be for rent. People were hopeful that with prohibition, crime rates and alcohol use would fall. But somehow with a ban on alcohol, things took a turn for the worst. Politically, it gave uh, a lot of cover to some extent to the politicians of the time. It allowed them to uh, divert attention away from perhaps some unpleasantries they were involved in and, and, and go after the rum runners, as they, as they called them at the time. In the United States, prison's population more than tripled. Not only were crime rates increasing, but groups were beginning to form and start a new threat to the law, organized crime. Crime syndicates began thriving during this time. Probably the most recognized crime ring was Al Capone and the mob. However, in some places, those that were supposed to uphold the law became criminals themselves. One such instance was in Evansville, Indiana. The chief of police, Edgar Schmidt, became a bootleg liquor dealer. Evansville had been a wide open town with almost 300 bars and many operated illegally without paying for a license. At first the city tried to get the bars to close early on weekdays and attempted to stop the sale of alcohol on Sundays. Barkeeps usually didn't follow either of the laws. Beer and all alcohol were a major role for the life of many people in Evansville. When Benjamin Bossy ran for mayor in 1914, one of his major campaign issues was the liquor laws. He promised to start heavily enforcing the prohibition of alcohol. In 1919, alcohol was still legal in Kentucky. The main way liquor made its way into Evansville was across the river from Kentucky. And my favorite story about how these men interacted uh, occurred uh, shortly after the Prohibition Act was, uh, was enacted in 1919. Ben Bossy made a big political play to show that he was supporting uh, prohibition by, by having a press conference and indicating he'd purchased a new boat to patrol the Ohio River to keep the rum runners from bringing illegal booze across into, into Evansville. And one of the first nights, if not the first night, of patrols, uh, the sheriff at the time, Males, uh, uh, intercepted the Evansville City Police rum patrol boat and they found that it was filled with illegal alcohol that was being brought across the river by the police captain in charge of the boat. And uh, that was, of course, a blemish in Ben Bossy's eyes because uh, his, his, uh, his police chief, Schmidt, uh, seemed to be uh, integrally involved in, in the booze running and, and, and the illegal booze sales in Evansville, Indiana. Chief Schmidt was being widely criticized because many of the people thought that he wasn't doing a good job of keeping alcohol out of Evansville. Schmidt pointed out that they had made 147 arrests within the first nine months of Prohibition, 40 or 50 or so within the first two months alone. At one point, Schmidt offered a $1,000 reward to the Women's Christian Temperance Union to anyone that knew of a river town that had better enforcement of the liquor laws than Evansville. In the later months of 1919, Schmidt started to come into the sights of federal investigators. One of the first things that began to tip off the federal investigators came on October 1st, 1919. A committee consisting of two ministers and two members of the WCTU went to the police department and asked to look at the confiscated liquor in the basement of police headquarters. Chief Schmidt adamantly refused. His temper out of control, he said no. I'll be damned if I let you in that cellar. You have come up here to accuse me of being a thief, a bootlegger. If I am, why don't the grand jury take it up? A few days later, on October 6th, Mayor Bossy called Schmidt into his office, and according to the mayor, Schmidt absolutely denied any of the charges directed against him. The newspapers on May 11th, 1920, would shock everyone in the city. Both newspaper's headlines read that Schmidt, along with Fred Osserberg of the Safety Board, Herb Males, Republican County Sheriff, the police, Captain Andy Friedel, along with 80 others, were all arrested on charges being a part of conspiracy 
for the importation of alcohol. All but 18 of them pled guilty to the charges. Judge Anderson dismissed the charges against four men in exchange for their testimony. This left only five defendants, Schmidt, Osserberg, Friedel, and two liquor distributors. On the trial's final day, Schmidt took the stand and denied everything. In closing arguments, Prosecutor Slack told the jury that seeing has how 79 people had already confessed, that was evidence enough. They found that all five of them, Schmidt, Osserberg, Friedel, Abe Kleiman, and Mose Kleiman, liquor dealers from Henderson, guilty. Schmidt was sentenced to two years in Atlanta Federal Prison and fined $2,000. Osserberg only got a year and a day in federal prison. Van Pickerill, leader of the whole thing, who sold more than 350000 in illegal alcohol, was sentenced to no jail time and only fined $2,000. After Schmidt was arrested, a captain named Ira Wiltshire took his place as chief of police. Prohibition in Evansville, much like the rest of the country, was a miserable failure. Instead of solving the problems in society, it created many more. Many public officials ended up on the wrong side of the law. The actions of Edgar Schmidt and other Evansville leaders shook the public's confidence, something that took years to rebuild. <laughs>